Good evening, everybody. This is Dolores Cannon again with the Metaphysical Hour. And we're back live tonight. I hope everybody had a good holiday season. We kind of took off during Christmas and New Year's, and they were playing reruns during that time. But now we're back on the air again with a live show tonight. Of course, they always say you can't tell when it's live and when it's not on there. Let me give the toll-free number if anybody wants to call in and ask questions tonight. The toll-free number is 1-888-815-9756. 888-815-9756. In case anybody wants to call in. Now, I've got a very special guest tonight. And uh, we go back many, many years. I've known him for a long time. <laughs> but this is Daniel Brinkley. And you're out in South Carolina, aren't you, Daniel? I'm in uh, Las Vegas uh, tonight. Oh, that's right. That's right. You told me you were living in Las Vegas now most of the time, aren't you? Well, uh, half a year. <laughs> I split the year. If I'm, too. <laughs> yeah, if yeah, I'm, said, uh, I spend the summers in South Carolina. Uh huh. Well, yeah, you're probably uh, feel more at home there with the gambling crowd. Is that what it is? I people don't really realize, Dolores, what a sacred vortex this is. I mean, Las Vegas just happens to be at 2,600 feet in the valley of 11,000 foot mountains. It uh-huh. has red rock, but it has what place called the Valley of the Fire, and it's five five hundred and twenty million years of of history you oh. can go to this you can go to this place and you can go layer by layer 520 million years of earth history from when this was 25,000 feet underwater oh. and you know every place you have a spiritual vortex you have literally every temptation and i guess that's why this place became what it is but uh-huh that's I probably in, why it- why it was built there then, you think? Well, I believe that this was a very sacred site for more than one native nation because you find uh, a lot of archaeological history. And a person who does, who's anthropologically, archaeologically focused sees that this was always a sacred site. And you have 11,000 uh-huh. foot mountains here. And I find it rather intriguing to to live here i mean i don't i don't gamble you know and i don't chase women not anymore and, not anymore well, no. you don't <laughs> well that's the truth but i like <laughs> i like to go to red rock and to the valley of fire and then i like to ride up in the mountains because how many places in america can it be 90 degrees uh, 90 degrees uh, when you walk outside and in less than 20 minutes you're in two feet of snow Oh, okay. Well, you know, where we live here in Arkansas, this is kind of a sacred spot, I guess you would say, because they say this place has always survived all the cataclysms that have ever happened in the North American continent. It goes way, way back, too. Well, it's also base of the great, uh, the oldest mountain chain in the world, the Appalachian yes, Mountain it is. Chain. And yes, it is one of, the mo- and one of the most... Uh, sacred because uh, it's the crystal formations. Yes, they are. They're very close to where we live. So it looks like both of us have chosen a good place to live for a definite reason. Well, I think that uh, as we evolve over the next four years, this place will change. I mean, because of the water situation and the nature of water. But, you know, we always have South Carolina and North Carolina. And then we were all planning on moving in with you when it got really rough, so I think it was okay. <laughs> we, Come we, on. <laughs> we were just saying you're probably warmer there right now than we are. Oh, yes. Yeah, so like here, 60. you know, we're going. What? It's like 66 going, degrees. Oh, oh. Send it this way, please. <laughs> we're going down below zero tonight. This is the coldest these last few days that it's ever, ever been in Arkansas. And well, it's please don't tell Al down. Gore that. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> it's moving all the way down to Florida, so this is a very bad cold front. We're all freezing here right now. 
Well, I wish you were here, but don't let Al Gore hear this tape because um, <laughs> it'll sure mess up mess up cap and trade. Oh, okay. All right, Daniel, but I'm going to tell people out there who you are, but I don't think there's anybody around who doesn't know who you are, but let's want to fill them in anyway. Uh, I think it's safe to say that you died three times and you lived to tell the story. Is that about right? Well, one one death experience. When I was struck by lightning in 1975, dead for 28 minutes, completely paralyzed for six days, partially paralyzed for seven months, two years to learn to walk and feed myself. And then because then I, uh, 14 years later I had open heart surgery and seven years after that I had brain surgery. But the second two experiences were on uh, mechanical ventilation. You know, uh -huh. I had three near death, ex one death experience and two near death experiences, Gloria, Gloria, I mean, uh, Dolores. But thanks to the glory of God, I got a chance to witness the process that we call death. But I was on life support doing uh, heart surgery and brain surgery. So I would like to say I died once, but I've had three near death experiences in five surgeries. Okay, so you think the other two was caused by the after effects of the lightning? Oh, yes, no question. Open heart surgery and brain surgery were direct results of surviving more than 180,000 volts of electricity. You know, I it's just slowly debilitated. I mean, I have problems now. Uh, but, you know, you, you take it one day at a time and you deal with it, but no one ever, no one ever survived this direct hit and lived as long as I did, so um, all I'm ever do is thankful, and I believe that having an understanding of what's next also empowers me to fight through some of the issues that I deal with, mm -hmm. and but, also uh, having, and also having you love me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if people out there, some of them probably know, but they did make a movie about your life and about the experiences that you had. And well, that it movie became the, is, it's it became the highest on. rated television movie in history, Dolores, and now it's been seen in 60 countries by 100 million people. And I'm in negotiations right now to do a major remake. I think it's for, I think it's either Showtime, Star, HBO, one of those. Yeah. I mean, the agents do all that. I just, I just say, when they get to a certain point, I just say yes or no. But when you look at what digital, what you can do now with uh, mm -hmm. computer and digital um, creations, what could happen with the movie now after in the time of remakes could be fabulous. Mm -hmm. Well, then you weren't, satis you weren't satisfied with the original? You think it should be done again? Well, you just listen to what people talk about, you know. My world is this. I write books about the things that I see in my hospice work. I mean, yeah. what I gained, what, what happened to me was after going through three of these experiences, I became a hospice volunteer because everything that most people go through in the end of life, in the end of life care processes, I've already been through it. I've been through all the pain and rehabilitation and all the fear and all of that. So I can usually, I can usually uh, empathize with the person in transition. And being 84, I'm 84 hours away from 26,000 hours at the bedside. So wow. when I look at, when I look at 32 years and 26,000 hours at the bedside, I can add a lot more to a film and add a lot more subtext to a film. You know, uh -huh. Hollywood just does what it wants to do and it wants to scare people and, you know, whatever else all that's about. But if I'm a part of the writing process and Catherine is a part of the writing process, then there's a lot of subtext that I could put in a new film. But I, Eric Roberts, I think that uh, in the original film, which you can, anyone can go get it on mistfilms.com, uh, in, in DVD, I think Eric did an excellent job, but there is just too much 
uh, more reality and visual reality to this experience that we can bring. And, you know, the near-death experience comes back into style about every two years, Dolores. Yeah. And now Deepak has a book out. Uh, um, uh, Sanjay Gupta has a Deepak. Jeffrey Long's new studies is Dr. Long's studies is coming out. Dio Show's new book is out. And so now this this quantitative value of near death is beginning for people to really focus on it. And I think why? In 1975, when I had the first near death experience, no one had ever heard of that. Right. It, yeah. it, it was Raymond, Dr. Moody, who gave it the name. Yeah. And so since then, they say about 830 people uh, uh, register some form of this experience. But I had it when it didn't have a name. And you also look at this. In our age group, we are at the point where all of us know someone in uh, in the baby boomers and just up in front of the baby baby boomers. We're all dealing with loss. Every one of us knows someone who is in transition. <clears throat> you know, for me, it's my last two uncles uh, of my entire family. My last two uncles are there. And we all are retiring, <clears throat> and we're all dealing with brothers and sisters and parents. And so this thing that we quote unquote quote quote unquote quote unquote called death, which really never happens, and whoever came up with the concept that someone dies is an absolute fool. Yeah. It will never happen. It does not happen. It's not going to happen. All we do is go from one one vibration to another vibration. Now, when so, you when that happened with you, where, could you talk a little bit more about your your experience, maybe more your conscious, you know, a little bit more detail and everything about it, what you remember? Sure. Well, I, I, do, I, I do think they didn't you say that your life was totally changed after this anyway, wasn't it? You well, were a totally you, different person before this happened to you. Well, once you grow up in South Carolina as a complete jackass, you know, I grew up as a tough guy, and I'm a big old guy, and I'm tough. I grew up knocking people out. I never had a frustrating day in my life until after being struck by lightning, because if I had an issue, I dealt with it at that moment, and then I hit you just as hard as I could hit you, and then I had the conversation. So... And I grew up that way, and then I played sports, which, you know, you got to beat up people, and people thought it was really something because you could knock them down or you could outrun or catch the football or tackle. Then I discovered the United States Marine Corps, which kind of fulfilled my whole life. And then once you get struck by lightning, and I hate to say it, but South Carolina was in the 70s and the 60s and the 50s wasn't really a great place to become spiritually connected because you were always hearing about Jesus. That, <laughs> yeah, I understand completely. <laughs> yeah, I never did. And I was told I was going to hell from the day from from five years old till you know twenty five years old, and I probably truly deserved to go. But what happened was when you enter a place, Dolores. That you're hit, you're burning, you're on fire. You can't see, you can't move, you don't know what's happened. Then all of a sudden you lift out of your body and there's no pain. And you're like watching it on television. You become literally disinterested in it except from an observational point of view. And I went from burning, paralysis, and blind to calm, peaceful, and could see. I could watch everything that was going on, and I could watch the people work on me. Uh, Sandy, my girlfriend, was working on me. The guy on the other end of the phone who was a corpsman in the Navy came over. They were working really hard to try to resuscitate me. And remember, I spent two years learning to walk and feed myself. And I was floating above it watching it, and it was so amazing to me that everything has a life form. And Sandy and Tommy were energy beings. You know, they were they were like their physical body seemed like an empty shell. And they were these beautiful, vibrant colors, these colors that I have never seen these colors on this this side of the veil. 
And I watched it, and when the paramedics got there, watching them having talking back and forth to each other and the intertwining of their energy, it was the most beautiful array of color that I'd ever seen. And <clears throat> they put me in the ambulance, and the guys were working on me, and then I heard this, this the, the corpsman, I mean the um, paramedic say, he's gone, he's gone. I thought, gone where? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, the paramedic's here, and the lump's there. And then I heard these chimes, these beautiful, melodic chimes. And then I looked over my right shoulder, and I could see this tunnel forming, and it was moving whether I was moving or not. And I was pulled down this tunnel. But there never was fear, and I need everybody to remember. The moment you lift out of your body, there is no fear. Through these first two experiences, I never experienced any fear. You get to the end of the tunnel and you come into this bright, brilliant, beautiful light. And it's a silvery blue. It has like a hue to it. And, you know, I'm watching this. And I always, you know, I'm curious. And I decided to look down at my body. So I, just, I looked at my right hand and I'm left-handed. This is, you know, this is how obsessive compulsive people think. Why would I not look at my left hand instead of look at my right hand? And I looked down at, at my right hand, and it wasn't there. And within an instant, it began to form where I had a hand. And the way it looked to me was, you know, if you put your hand underwater in a swimming pool, it looks elongated because of the refraction of of uh, sunlight off the water. It looks like your fingers are longer. Right. Well, it was elongated, and it was it had a a, a shimmer to it. And then I was not interested in that anymore, and I can remember my hand fading uh, once I took my focus off. And then this being, and this illustriously beautiful being came toward me. And, you know, and people have given it a lot of names, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Allah, Krishna, I mean, God, I mean, there's so many names, and... I really didn't have a name for this being. I was just glad that there was someone who was there. <clears throat> and what people, excuse me, and what people always describe is the feeling. And what I try to give people is my definition of the feeling. Do you know you know the difference between getting caught by your father for doing something that you're not supposed to do, or your grandfather? Your father, yeah. he's gonna, your father, he's gonna beat your tail. Your grandfather, you just have to listen to it for about 20 minutes, and then at the end you could probably still get him for a quarter. <laughs> so so it was like getting caught by your grandfather. And it's being, and it was that I wasn't alone and that I was safe. And then I had, Dolores, what I believe to be the single most important component of all of this, the part that changed the old Daniel into the becoming Daniel. I mean, I didn't say I converted from being a jackass instantly, but I'm still in the process. But your life will pass before you. And this is everybody. You will see your entire life pass before you in a 360-degree panorama. You will see everything that you've ever done. Literally, you will know how many hairs was in the nose of the doctor who pulled you from your mother. You will know every every person in the room, every piece of equipment. Oh, you way home from the. <clears throat> Excuse me. Very minute detail. On the way home, you'll know how many leaves is on every tree. Wow. Hmm. And you will see all this at once. Then you will watch it from a second person point of view. All this is happening mm -hmm. simultaneously. Uh -huh. You will watch it from a second person point of view to look at your choices. We all have choices in our lives and we all make choices. A lot of times we think we have no choice in the situations and decision-making things that we do. But what this second-person point of view is, is to see what choices you really had. What were the options that belong to you as a spiritual being in a human life? <clears throat> you know, I always say that we're great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose. And we choose to take on this mental, physical form so that we can accentuate certain things in our own growth, but that we're chosen to come here. Mm -hmm. You know, you get, you're chosen to come and then you choose. And then thirdly in this panoramic life review, 
you literally will become every person that you've ever encountered. And you will feel the direct results of your interaction between you and every person that you've ever encountered. You will become them. Well, what I got to experience in that life review was what it was like in all the damage I had done to people, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. Mm-hmm. And once that happened and I had a chance to be all of these people, it was completely life-changing. What in the world was I doing? And then came the system of judgment. <clears throat> and that's when this being uh, mentally transmitted to me this thought. And here is how we will all be judged. If divinity could not come today, or if God could not come today, and God had sent you, in the life you just reviewed, what difference did God make? Well, that was it. I mean, that was completely it. That was the single most transformative point of all the other cosmic stuff I always relate to. And you've heard all those stories. You know, but that was it. If God couldn't come today and God sent me, in the life I just reviewed, what difference did God make? I became back. I mean, when I came back, I became a hospice volunteer. Mm -hmm. Because people are scared to death of death. They're scared to death of pain. I know what's next. And so now, 84 hours away from 26,000 hours, 1,800 people, within hours of passing from this world, and I lost my 377th person the Sunday before Christmas. That's a lot of so, people you've been working with. Yeah. Well, God couldn't come today, and God sent me, and these were mostly veterans. My, uh, my you know, yeah, youngest... That's, that's one thing I found in my work, too, is people are so afraid of death because... Well, I hate to say it, but the church has really brainwashed them and indoctrinated them to think they're going to hell, and they're terrified to die. But you also have religions and institutions and governments that do the same thing. So people always, you know, people always say, Daniel, why are you always so happy? I said, well, two things I know. I didn't die, and I didn't go to hell. And if anybody was going to hell, it certainly would have been me. <laughs> and, if any, and if anybody who de- and if anybody deserved to die, I can guarantee I'm your candidate. And neither <laughs> one of these things have ever happened through three of these experiences. So for everybody that's listening, it's okay to be afraid, but it's not okay to be unsure. No one will die. And you will see your loved ones. You will see your friends, your relatives, your loved ones, your pets, parakeets, angels, uh, <clears throat> you see parakeets, chickens, birds, dogs, cats, <laughs> anything that you've ever loved and that's ever loved you will be there. That's the gift. You know, I always tell people, they say, well, Daniel, why, could, why do you never talk about seeing your loved ones? I said, well, I can tell you if you want to understand what kind of person I was growing up. Uh, I can tell you, I've been over there three times and no relatives come to meet me yet. <clears throat> so it really gives you an idea of what kind of person I was growing up. But I don't think <laughs> uh-huh. I don't think that if I had seen my mom or I'd seen my dad or I had seen some people that I really, really miss, that I would have persevered to be able to achieve the goals that I'm doing here and I think divinity has a better idea because I was coming back. I wasn't staying. I That's never knew. Were you, were you conscious that you were, I mean, did you make a decision to come back, or do you remember that part? Or did hell you, no, did I didn't say make it a wasn't decision. Time? <laughs> no, I, I okay. mean, hell no, because if somebody would have given me a choice, I would have told them absolutely not. And if I would have thought for one moment those first two times that I was coming back, that I would still be hiding behind clouds. There is okay. nobody that has ever seen what I've seen would ever want to come back here. Mm-hmm. And then there are people who are given choices, you know, because they have children to raise or they have a purpose. Mm-hmm. Now, in the third experience, it was different. Because in the second experience, I got to have another panoramic life review, and I believe that there is something that divinity, that the divine wants me to achieve, and I work on that every day. That's what my hospice work is about. But in the third experience, 
and brain surgery. I didn't lift out of my body. I was standing at the end of the bed. And it was the blue-gray place. Every When I say there's three stages, there's the blue-gray place, then the tunnel, and then, then the other dimension, or what you would call heaven. But the first two times in this blue-gray place, I thought I was the only one there, which is very typical of my personality. If it isn't about me, I don't really care. And, and I thought I was the only one there. But I started seeing other layers and other dimensions that was in this blue-gray place when I was watching my brain surgery, and I'm watching my brain surgery. And then the tunnel forms, I hear the chimes, and I start down the tunnel. I begin, I get to the end of the tunnel, I see the being of light. I begin the panoramic life review. But I wasn't interested in that. Look how much control you have as a spiritual being. I was more interested in the blue-gray place because it was a new world to me. I'd already seen this world twice, 14 years apart, and now I'm seven years. Remember, 22 years between the two experiences. And to give you an idea of what kind of practical joker God is, I was struck by lightning on September the 17th at 7.05 p.m. uh, on a Wednesday afternoon during a thunderstorm in 1975. I had brain surgery at 7.05 a.m. on a Wednesday morning, September the 17th, during a thunderstorm. Oh, my Uh God. (laughs) You know, I used to to always say, you know, I believe in coincidences. I've just never seen one. Yeah. Well, they said, (laughs) well, okay, Dan, here's you something to think about. So when I started to do the panoramic life review... I had already been through the cities of light, like in the Bible it says, in my father's house there are many mansions and I go to prepare a place to you. It's something that the Christ said. And if this were not true, why would I say it? Well, that's true. There are many beautiful, magnificent crystal cities. We don't all come from the same place. We don't just all lump in from one place. We come from different realms with different talents and different insights and different capabilities. We come to the earth as teams. You know, very rarely does a family grow up under the same roof. And we come with different incentives and different ideals, and we come together in teams and friendships, and we move forward. So I came back to this blue-gray place, and it was curious to me. And it gave me this place to understand where ghosts come from, where paranormal experiences occur, where what some people call attachments or possessions come from. And I never had an idea about that. Although I'd been dead and through this experience, I never really latched on to that as a concept, although I would see it. I mean, I go in any hospital and I see people um, all the time that no one else sees. In a graveyard, you see them all the time. And in a lot of places that you go, I see these beings, but, you know, I didn't care I mean, they they weren't talking to me or being bothered with me, so I never got interested. But in this blue-gray place, I could see places for people who were trapped, not by their own, I mean, not by some outside force, but by their own self, that they had chosen not to go down the tunnel. And as I would look at it and I would watch, you know, my obsessive-compulsive personality, I'm looking at why. And I saw, I saw people who were trapped who liked being jerks, who liked wow. uh, being power hungry. I saw groups of women who, in the name of love, what they had allowed happen to themselves or their children, and they just didn't feel like the integrity or the 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 spiritual spiritually deserving of going to quote unquote heaven. And I saw a lot of soldiers soldiers from many, many wars who had felt deserted and betrayed and who died in prison camps and who were left behind, and not just in the Vietnam War, but in every war. You know, you make peace and then you forget the rest of it, and we, we as Americans and we as everybody else, no one really cares about a veteran. They wave the flag on Veterans Day, but I, I have 32 years in the VA. I know who cares and who doesn't. Mm-hmm. And as I watched this, I was amazed by it. 
And I always figured that if I had not have changed from seeing the life review, it would be where I would be, you know, because oh. I'm tough, the Lord. You know, I'm a big old monstrous guy. And I would have ended up there. And, and then I could understand where ghosts come from and where people who do drugs and alcohol or develop mental problems because this frequency, this place is very, very close. That's why I created the Twilight Brigade. You know, Danian.com, D-A-N-N-I-O-N.com, and then go to the Twilight Brigade, and that's this organization. It's 5,200 people in 22 states. And I didn't realize that I stayed in this blue-gray place for after the brain surgery. I was in the recovery room for 41 hours. Oh, my goodness. Obsessive compulsive. You know, once, <laughs> you know, once you get attached to something, I have to know everything about it. <laughs> so I was in recovery for 41 hours. When I came out of recovery, I had a massive grand mal seizure and was put in the neural cardiac ward on life support. So I, I, they didn't think I would make it through that because after brain surgery, the standard things that happen is... You usually have a heart attack or a stroke or a brain aneurysm. So, you know, they gave me an 8% chance of survival. But so what? So it came back. So in the course of my 60 years on this earth and my 35 years of studying death, we have three phases. We have this blue-gray place that we go so that we can acclimate ourselves in the world that we're leaving and catch a breath. And it's not really a breath. You realize that once you lift out of your body, you don't breathe. You vibrate. Mm -hmm. You pulse. It's not breathing. You pulse. Mm -hmm. Like all energy, it has a certain frequency, harmonic, and a certain, and a certain pulse. And then down the tunnel into the into the light where you are met by this being of light. It's really hard for people when I tell them that I know who this being of light is. This being of light is really you. <laughs> okay. Very good. Very good. You, you have never left heaven. Right. It is completely impossible to do what people in religions and what uh, fanatics say. Think of this, you guys. How can some little punk angel, he's got like so many uh, uh, aliases, Lucifer, Satan, Devil, uh, uh, morning, the Morning Star, all of that. He's got like nine million names. How can some silly angel get mad at God <laughs> and go and create a place outside of the universe that is that is called, that you can be eternally damned. That's insane. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I that, agree. I agree. It goes with my work too, Daniel. I understand it, but it's insane. It is impossible for it to happen. How uh -huh. can you separate from the one? Uh -huh. You can't do it. So what happens is. When I realized that that was me, you know, my obsessive compulsive personality, I get fixated on trying to understand that, you know. Yeah. So I started looking at physics and uh, mechanics, quantum mechanics, atomic and subatomic perspectives. It's easy. An atom, the basic physical component of all matter. I mean, everything is composed of atoms. An atom is 94.6% empty space. Right. Mm -hmm. So what that means is physical reality will never be more than 5% of reality, no matter what. Then where's the other 94.6%? It's connected in what we call now dark matter. And they built a the, the CERN, which is a collider in Switzerland, to create the Big Bang Theory by colliding electrons, I mean protons and electrons, into each other to try to create a way to modulate what we call dark matter, the matter that the universe is suspended in. I think it's really uh, arrogant for human beings to call God dark matter. But... <laughs> 
you got always where in where in an atom is the light, the nuclei. It's in the center. Right. So when you look at physical matter, there is no way you have ever gone anywhere. You are still a part of the divine. Mm-hmm. You just happen to focus in the physical because it has to be mentally and physically protected because you can harm it. You can hurt someone's feelings because you think it to be painful, and then you emotionally react to it. You protect yourself physically because you can feel pain. So all of a sudden, instead of keeping us spiritually focused, we create, we can, we can get more reaction out of somebody through fear than we can through out of love. And we have create, and we've created this mentality of protecting our physical selves because it has ability to age. And as we age, our mindset changes. I hope that we mature, but our mindset changes. And we get, we get affected by that. But we've never left heaven. There is no place you're going to ever be but to dwell in the divine. There is no other way. And what I love now, Dolores and guys, is this. Quantum mechanics, so much mythology is now reality. Quantum mm-hmm. mechanics right. says this is true. The multi-universe theory, which is what people say, that means you're occupying more than one level of consciousness at the same time. Mm-hmm. When I first heard that, I, was, I, I realized why I was so tired when I woke up in the morning. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. If I'm doing all this work in all these other places, no wonder I'm tired. But uh-huh. when you look at the multi-universe theory that says you're occupying between 11 and 17 simultaneous realities, well, that sounds crazy. Okay, then you say, well, show me something that would prove that, and or else it's just another theory somebody pontificated. And what the multi-universe theory says that uh, energy and matter can occupy the same space. That means light as a form of energy and light as a form of matter can occupy the same place. And it was a theory put forth by a German named Planck in 1801. Well, the multi-universe theory, in modern day, equal to that you are occupying between 11 and 17 simultaneous levels of consciousness, we have created the cell phone, the DVD, the CD, and the personal computer. Okay. And when you start to think about spiritual reality, can you imagine that I could take my cell phone out of my pocket, which is my daughter's four-year-old cell phone? Because <laughs> uh, I get all the hand-me-downs. I, I can take a picture of this picture sitting on my desk, and I can send it to a friend of mine in the Russian embassy. And he can have it in less than three seconds. And we think there's some place else other than heaven. And we think that we're in some other state of consciousness. My cell phone doesn't believe that. And neither does his. And when you start to think about that we are capable of doing that, and that we have the Internet that connects us, and we have iPhones, and we have apps, and we have... uh, we have droids, we have all these phones in the communication, and not to believe that we're all not connected. That just makes you stupid. So after three of these experiences and 26,000 hours and 32 years of studying death, I can quantitatively and without any questions say it will never happen. And as long as you think it will happen, you are missing out on the best parts of your life. Mm. Mm-hmm. We should live without fear. Because we're giving up a country. We're giving up a country. Well, that's living in fear. We're not supposed to live in fear anyway because that does hold us back. Not hold us back. We're giving up our sovereignty. We are watching, based on the Mayan prophecies of 2012, what is happening to us today is we're giving up our our immortal rights as endowed with certain enabled rights. You know, we are, we are endowed with certain inalienable rights. So among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if you look at where our governments, our institutions, and our religions are, they are quickly, based on fear, 
We are a definitely. democracy at war with a religion. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I've learned that we can't be afraid of that. And as we build fear, we feed fear. Right. And as we feel fear, feel as we build fear, there are two things that we think about: pain. Mm-hmm. You know, and as we think about pain or suffering, are the unknown. What is happening in our world is the concepts that we mostly are, are identify with death have been moved forward into a lifestyle called terror. Oh, when definitely. Been, that's it. That's what we keep thinking. All of this is to promote, to promote fear in population. A lot of it is for control, but it, it, the whole thing is to promote fear. With the well, terrorism I, things and, you know, the swine flu, all of it. It, it, it. If people could just see what's behind it, it's people to make see people it. afraid. But, Dolores, people see it. People see it, but they are so used to their lifestyle. They think that if they let the the loss of our fear and we don't have to buckle down and make differences and realize what's happening to us, that we have to change our lifestyle. And that's mm-hmm. what people are afraid of. We're all comfortable living a lie. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks to the Mayans <laughs> and thanks to Nostradamus and thanks to some of the Malachi, Malarkey, some of the great prophets and, and seers of old, we realize that, like it or not, it's going to come to an end. Like the Mayans say, uh, we are in the end of the sixth night of the galactic period. It started November the 9th, 2009. It will run till February the 10th, um, 2011. What the Mayans say in their, in their calendar, which is 16 billion years, which is roughly the age of the Earth, what they say is all things not done in integrity will pass away. Uh-huh. Well, our government is collapsing. Uh-huh. Our economic system is collapsing. We are $13 trillion in debt. Think about a trillion dollars. A million dollars in something relatively, let's say, seconds. A million seconds is 12 years. A trillion seconds is 30,330 years. Roughly, wow. and we owe that, thirteen trillion dollars. So mm, that, that means puts it, puts it into a better proportion perspective. Perspective yeah. that you can uh, look at it that way. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder causes you to yeah. do that. <laughs> but do you think then, until that date in nineteen uh, two thousand and eleven, that this is an era of change? Is that what you mean? Absolutely, one hundred percent. You batten down the hatches, you you look at your economic situation, you make sure you have fundamentally enough food, you know, you don't we have a we have a room full of food. It won't be the best things to eat, but I'm gonna make sure it's sitting there. We have enough water. If you go on the net if you go on the Homeland Security website it says starting in two thousand ten, you need to be prepared to last from six days to six weeks because the solar flare activity. It starts in 2010. They're putting up set satellites left and right because the satellites that we have up now have no sheathing. And with no sheathing, that a solar flare can knock it out, and even your gas station runs off of, uh, off of satellite power. Huh. So uh-huh. we're living in a world of what the Mayans talked about. We're living in a world that's coming true. And I'm prepared. I have been prepared because, Dolores, you know I had those... 117 things that I did not know they were future events. I wrote about in Saved by the Light. I updated in uh, Spiritual Strategies. I think I think it comes up. I think it comes up like around the 25th of January because I'm going back to the Yucatan on the 18th for my. I think my. I think this is my 35th trip. You know, I'm a big Mayan freak. Uh-huh. The Olmecs, the Olmecs, and the Mayans are just captivate me. So I've been exploring that for 40 years. So I'm going back, and then I'm going to put up the predictions that the original predictions that I made in the 70s, 76, and then I'm going to update them. I'm going to look at them as a 60-year-old guy 35 years later. Most of them have come true. Some of them didn't happen exactly the way I described it, but it was a fool telling the story then. Mm-hmm. And when I wrote it in Saved, and all my, you know, all my books on Amazon, 
when I wrote it in Saved uh, in 93, I wrote it just the way it happened in 75. I didn't add um, that perspective. I just told, I wanted to write it the way, the way I saw it because I was telling the story in that time frame. And I know I've talked this whole hour, but I'm really sorry. No, you're supposed to talk an hour. No, no, well, I mean, wonderful. I, it's this is, wonderful. This is wonderful. But <laughs> uh, Daniel, I've noticed the same things. You know, I wrote the three volumes on the prophecies of Nostradamus, and they came out in 1989. And I've been going over them again. It's the same way. A lot of it has come true, and some of it has not. So this is the way we know things are changing. And I yeah, think that's we the have more. Con- about, we have more that's control. That's the greatness right? about the human experience. Yes, I mean, we have more I'll, control. I always wrote that, that it said that the beings told me nothing was carved in stone. So uh-huh. yeah. it's like the Bob, the guy in the Bible when it didn't happen, and everybody was making fun of him. I was happy. You know, but I Uh still see the possibilities, Uh you know, and people think the big wars that we're going to be fighting is over oil. It's going to be over water. Water. And, yeah, the biggest war we will ever fight, and what is happening now, especially in Israel, because they have no water. Oh. There is no water. Okay, the, the Jordan River is about the size of my little finger, and... They, uh-huh. There is no water, and the only water source that the Israelis have is the Golan Heights, which supposedly belongs to the Syrians, and they have what's called the Shema Farms. The only other access to fresh water that Israel has is a river 25 miles into into Lebanon. And That's, This, this is, is one of the reasons for the wars over there, then, isn't it? It is the reason. Mm-hmm. Where they're wanting to Not one of the reasons. land. This mm-hmm. is the reason. Okay. It's always going to be about Jerusalem because that is the Israeli identity. But all this other stuff, the Gaza and the West Bank, that's all foolishness. It's all about water. Mm-hmm. And if they can if they can create a link between the West Bank Okay, which was always belonged to Jordan. Yeah. The West Bank never was Palestinian. It was Jordan. And remember, Jordan didn't come into existence until the 30s. <laughs> There's no such thing as Jordan in biblical history. It was created in the Balfour Agreement by some British under the, the 1948, Bal- 1945 Balfour Agreement, which was to establish a Palestinian state. And Israel took it as the establishment of a Palestinian state, I mean of a state of Israel. So without completely recapturing Jerusalem, which is what Netanyahu is working so very desperately to do, they can never declare the old Israel, the upper and lower kingdom, into one. But no one believes that. It's all about water. They cannot desalinate fast enough. But you got to give it to the Israelis and the genius of what they've innovated in irrigation and drip irrigation and how they've uh-huh. innovated in technologies. I mean, the brilliance of this country. I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in innovation and wonderment. But I always said that there would come a moment when the West Bank, the, the Palestinian state, will be a part of Jordan. And so now that the... Now that the king of Jordan has dissolved his parliament and he can't put a parliament together, everybody should watch the geopolitical nature of the rise of a Palestinian West Bank separated from Gaza as Jordan is recreating its own uh, new parliament at the resolution. And more Palestinians live in Jordan than live in, um, than live in the West Bank or Gaza. Well, you know, Daniel, when I was in India, I was at the Taj Mahal, and um, people told me there's this huge river that runs right behind the Taj Mahal, used to be an enormous river, and it was down to one quarter the size. So the water there is also diminishing. Well, um, I don't the, remember the reason, but they were talking about the river. It's drying, up, huge it's river. drying up because of farming. What's happening farm- is water is going to be... You know, water's going to be, China has polluted all of its water. 
okay? Uh-huh. And India's water, the wells are drying up. You know, and we also have what is uh, the, 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 the melting the ice, the change in the ice. You know, it's a little climate change. You know, they don't call it global warming anymore. They call it climate change. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, here's what's happening. This is a water planet. And so let's say that there's only 3% of the Earth's water that is drinkable. Okay? 3%. 3%, that's all, and most of it is ice, glaciers. So in all of Amer- in all of the world, there is less than 1% drinkable water. Mm-hmm. The last great reserve of fresh drinkable water is the Great Lakes. Oh. So the United States has the largest fresh water reserves in the world. And when you start to think about that, there is two things. You can go a long time without gasoline, but how long can you go without water? That's true. And what will happen in the next three years is water will become a commodity. Well, I know in Russia there's this huge lake there that they say are going down very fast. It's gone. I mean, it's gone. You look at at the uh, Caspian Sea. You look at all over, and if people take who's listening, pay attention to the water reserves. Pay attention. This will be the great battle. <clears throat> we have enough gas, natural gas to power America, every car and every automobile and all industry for 400 years, just in natural gas. If we convert it, all the trucks that go down the road, all the 18-wheelers to natural gas, we would reduce our carbon footprint. If we burned it natural gas instead of coal-fired plants, we would reduce the more carbon footprint. If we looked at how you changed hydrogen into, which is, if we looked at you look at water and you changed water, which is hydrogen and oxygen, that's another funny thing about God. The two most powerful burning elements on the earth is hydrogen and oxygen. And when you put the two together, you create water, which will put both of them out. <laughs> well, Daddy I mean, and I'm watching know. the clock. We're going to have to be stopping here pretty soon. Uh, but let me just say one thing. When I was in Dubai, uh, they have really, they do, do things we could do here. They take water from the Persian Gulf, and they, they turn it into fresh water, and they use it to the whole uh, city there of Dubai. But you could do the same thing. That's, that's desalinization. We yeah, don't we need to do it. It's the rest of the world that needs to do it. That's desalinization. Yeah. And when you look at you desalinate only enough that you can water with it. The human body, because of the salt content of seawater and desalinization, you still are going to harden arteries. You still are going to create things oh, that okay. sodium sodium do. But, you know, Dubai is a wasteland. Yes, it's I mean, desert there. It's empty. It is completely collapsed. All that stuff and all those islands that they built, that's over. And there's no water. So we live in this world, and I beg everybody to never be afraid. And why? Like I write in Secrets of the Light. And remember, all my stuff is on either Danion.com or the books are on Amazon. All you have to do is go to Amazon and type in my first name, D-A-N-N-I-O-N. Or go on the Internet and just type in my first name. And I believe this, and I believe this from my soul. We chose to be here at this time because there is nobody greater than us that make the difference. We're living in a transitorial period. We're going ending a 25,920-year cycle, the procession through the, through the equinox. And we're moving from one constellation into another. We're going from the Piscean to the Aquarian. There has to be those people who keep the light lit, whose hearts stay strong, whose confidence and belief in the divine is unwavering, so that those who are on the verge of collapsing or fear or fright have someone to turn to and to have people who they can admire or appreciate or ways of life that they can admire and appreciate so that we guide those young people or those people who are lost 
into this new life in this new world. And it is not based on fear. We will win the spiritual battle. We are not against anybody. Like people say, well, Daniel, aren't you against that? I said, I'm not against anything. I'm for something. Okay. I'm not against war. I'm for peace. Right. And when we okay, start Daniel, looking at... I, I hate to interrupt we, you. That's beautiful. But we are coming to the uh, to time. I have to stop. Otherwise, they'll pull the plug on me. I think well, you've got a sometime. wonderful hour. Yeah, have him back. <laughs> yeah, please have him back. <laughs> now, you you have done a wonderful talk here, and I know it's really going to reach a lot of people. And you give out your website, so I think people could contact you if you want them to. Daniel.com. Okay, and thank you a lot for coming on. And I love you, and bless that daughter, and I love you with all my heart, Dolores. <laughs> okay, and see we'll see soon. each other again, I know. I hope so, crossing. either here or on the other side. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All, All right. right. Well, good, good night, everyone, and thanks for listening. Good night. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.